man has always envied the birds their wings. At first, he thought that only the gods could fly. But sooner or later, he wanted to try it himself. After every failure, there were still the birds to show that it could be done. The first scientific study of bird flight was made by Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century. My first book treats of birds' flight by beating their wings. The second, without beating their wings and with the help of the wind. The third, of flight in general. Here, conceived 500 years ago, is the helicopter or lifting air screw and the parachute. But Leonardo's discoveries remained unpublished for 300 years and during that time, man's dreams of a flying machine were picturesque rather than practical. Yea, instruments to fly withal. Friction between a steel wheel adequately tempered and a very heavy and surprising piece of lodestone. The globes of heaven and earth containing in them attractive virtues. A pair of bellows which must be blown when there is no wind. Four copper globes from which all air has been extracted. Meanwhile, the birds kept their secret. In 1783, man made his first free flight in a hot air balloon invented by two Frenchmen, the brothers Montgolfier. Two years later, the wind being fair, a Frenchman and an American crossed the English Channel from Dover in a hydrogen balloon. But as free balloons could only sail with the wind, they soon became merely a fairground spectacle, with an occasional parachute descent thrown in. While the new toy held the public interest, the birds were almost forgotten. For a thousand years, the Chinese had been playing with kites, which arrived in Europe sometime in the 16th century. In 1804, Sir George Cayley turned the kite into a glider. The whole problem of mechanical flight is to make a surface support a given weight by the application of power to the resistance of the air. But the question was, how to apply the power to give a constant thrust? He already knew that the Chinese flying top would give a vertical thrust. And he thought that the same top could be made to provide a steady horizontal thrust if only he could find a light enough source of power. Forty years later, Mr. Stringfellow provided a small steam engine to drive the twin air screws of a miniature flying machine designed by Mr. Henson. Long before the model was ready, Mr. Henson began to dream of world airways. public laughed at it. So, after all, it was only a model which made the first successful power-driven flight in 1848. Not very impressive, perhaps, but these experiments with models had at least proved that a rigid wing could provide sufficient lift to support the aeroplane's weight, provided it is given enough thrust to overcome drag. The inclined plane with the horizontal propelling apparatus is the true principle of aerial navigation by mechanical means. On Cayley's advice, Stringfellow tried a biplane and a triplane. But the aeroplane still remained an uncontrollable flying dart. Meanwhile, people looked around for something a little less dangerous.
Hiram Maxim's four-ton machine with steam engines succeeded in lifting itself clear of the ground. Propulsion and lifting are solved. Control is a matter of time. Haste in such a venture is the worst of policies. Before he could use power, man had first to learn to fly. Lilienthal led the way with his fixed-wing glider controlling the machine by shifting his own weight. Chanute added the movable control surfaces, which we now call rudder and elevator. But he still lacked control of lateral stability. The Wright brothers adopted rudder and elevator and secured lateral stability at last by warping the wingtips. They were now satisfied that they had full control over their machine in the air. And the moment had come for a tempting, powered flight. That first historic flight on December the 17th, 1903, lasted only 12 seconds. Three years later, they could stay in the air for half an hour or so. But so little was heard of their achievements that a newspaper could say, all attempts at artificial aviation are not only dangerous to human life, but foredoomed to failure. When Wilbur Wright took his machine to France in 1908, he found several promising designs. By and large, European pioneers thought that an aeroplane should fly level of its own accord. But their tractor monoplanes and wheeled undercarriages were new. After watching some of Wright's bank turns, the Europeans began to change their minds about inherent stability and maneuverability. It was evident that the pilot must have three controls, even if he needed three hands and both feet. So the aileron was born, and the joystick. At this stage, the small underpowered aircraft offered less drag in monoplane form. But for many years, the stronger wing structure and lighter wing loading of the biplane were decisive factors. Very soon, the best features of each type were combined in the tractor biplane. Meanwhile, in 1909, Blériot had flown the channel, and Britain was no longer an island. Cash prizes tempted pilots to forsake their aerodromes and fly across country. Arrangements for refueling had to be organized along the route. When war broke out in 1914, the typical military aircraft was a two-seater tractor biplane. Very soon, two distinct types emerged, the bomber and the fighter. The single-seater fighter was small, fast and maneuverable. Speed and rate of climb were at a premium. 
In four years, the fighter developed into quite a neat little aircraft. In the same period, the heavy long-distance bomber made its appearance. God would not suffer such an invention to take effect. For who sees not that no city can be secure against attack? And they which cast down their fireworks and fireballs from a height out of gunshot cannot be offended by those from below. When all cock and brown flew a heavy bomber across the Atlantic in June 1919, it became obvious that the aero engine could now be trusted with passenger work. The first regular air services operated over short distances between capital cities. Presently, airways began to extend across the world. For every pioneer flight, fuel and oil had to be provided in a number of out-of-the-way places. bomber, it was only a short step to the large passenger aircraft, with everyone under cover. As machines increased in size and speed, the small aerodromes then existing on the outskirts of towns began to look a bit cramped. When bringing these heavier and faster aircraft into land, the problem was to fly them slowly enough without stalling. If the angle of attack is increased beyond a certain point, the wing will lose lift and stall. But when the leading edge slot was invented, the airflow was redirected smoothly along the upper surface. The lift was restored and the aircraft could fly more slowly without stalling. More and more people took to travelling by air, expecting to go further and faster. Still bigger payloads and longer flights at higher economical speeds called for cleaner aircraft. Undercarriages were retractable and wing flaps helped to reduce landing speed. A heavily laden aircraft needs a long run for takeoff, so once again airfields look too small. Air screws designed to give best results at top speed were less effective at takeoff, so the variable pitch air screw arrived. This allowed the blades to be set fine for takeoff, where maximum thrust is most needed. And so the civil aircraft came of age, only to be overtaken by the shadow of war. Now began the Battle of the Blueprints. On a thousand drawing boards, designs were taking shape for new types of monoplane fighter, built round engines of ever-increasing power. In the air, these new machines were able to operate at higher altitudes, at a higher rate of climb, a much greater level speed. Under the stress of war, development was much more rapid. Still more level speed. Still faster rate of climb.
and a higher service ceiling. The drawing board teams fought on. The aircraft designer was always wanting more engine power. The aero engine designer clamoured for more and more special fuel. And the petroleum technician always had to find the answer. Dimerization of butylene? Hydrocodimer? We've been trying for years to find a way of making high-octane gasoline in quantity. And now they want enormous quantities. Where is it going to come from? Calculations, the answer. Fuel for higher performance. A hundred octane. Right up to 125, 165 grade. Then just when they were all satisfied they'd perfected the piston-engined aircraft and its fuel, they had to go and dream up the jet. And turbojet fuel is very much like the paraffin which was invented a hundred years ago by James Young, the founder of the oil refining industry. With jet engines, fighter aircraft were given at one stroke much more speed, much greater rate of climb, and much higher service ceiling. When the air routes were once more open to civil flying, designers began to harness the new power to passenger aircraft. The long distance turbojet, and turboprop airliners, the long and medium distance services. As for military aircraft, the designer now has all the power he wants. He can fly through the sound barrier. flying has entered on a new and fascinating era of discovery. And once again, man shapes his wings. <laughs> 